name's Michael. Um, I'm the CEO of Uniotech. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've been innovating with LoRaWAN technology. So quickly, a little bit about us. Um, we're a small team, four of us at the moment, um, and we provide IoT sensor networks um, to help people collect data from hard to reach places. So places where Wi-Fi or cellular signals might not uh, might not reach or might not be cost effective. Um, we offer solutions that go from a single sensor right up to smart cities. And the data from that is key to helping people make better decisions. So you can see a few of the, the customers that we've, we've worked with recently on projects here. Um, key ones, Norfolk County Council and Suffolk County Council have been really supportive. So we'll talk a little bit more about them as we go on. So why LoRaWAN technology? So, well, first of all, um, it's a, a great system. So LoRaWAN stands for Long Range Wide Area Network. And some of the key features here are it's really low power technology. So these devices typically battery powered. Um, they can run from a single AA size battery for up to 10 years. Um, they're long range. So the, the signal from these um, has got really good uh, anti-interference capabilities so it can it can get through uh, walls um, you can have sensors in, in buildings that are connecting to gateways several kilometers away um, as an example we've got a gateway on the top of county hall in in norwich which uh, has a range that goes all the way out to the coast down past long stratton all of norwich is covered by that gateway so a really well placed gateway can have a fantastic um, coverage there's a huge range of sensors available as well. So you're not tied to a couple of devices from a couple of manufacturers. Um, there's open standards in, in LoRaWAN. So any manufacturer can uh, can decide to use the technology and, and create a, a device. So there's a range of things from mouse traps we've got on the screen here, service buttons, GPS trackers, flood sensors, street light controllers, temperature sensors, or pretty much anything you can think of. If it can send a small packet of data, um, there's a LoRaWAN sensor for it. Flexibility, um, something you don't get from uh, using cellular data networks. If you decide to use SIM cards and a mobile operator, you're tied to their coverage. So if, uh, if your mobile network operator doesn't have coverage where you want to put a sensor, then there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, LoRaWAN's great that you can either join a public network. Um, we'll talk about the uh, Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network in a bit, but you can also build your own network. So if you want to have a completely private network that's just for your devices, you can deploy your own gateways. If not, you can connect to a public network like the one across Norfolk and Suffolk, or you can do a combination of the two and there's roaming available between networks as well. So um, devices can roam across the public and private networks all over Europe as well. And it's secure. The traffic's encrypted end-to-end -end from the device all the way up to the, the application server. So you know that you've got uh, good security. There's a whole load of um, processes built into it to prevent any sort of replay attacks or um, man-in-the-middle style, style attacks as well. So the system is very robust and secure. So how does it work? So each of those devices communicates with one or preferably multiple gateways. Um, the traffic's asymmetric, so the majority of the data is uplinks from devices, but you can also send downlink packets to them as well. Um, LoRaWAN devices come in in a couple of different uh, flavors. So there's uh, class A devices, which wake up at a certain point. So maybe a sensor has been activated or you've asked it to notify you every 10 minutes of the river level. The device will wake up, read its sensors, and send the data, and then it listens for a, a very short period for a reply from the network. If it doesn't hear anything, it just goes back to sleep and it will wake up again next time it needs to. Um, so that little window is your chance to send it a downlink command, which could be updating its configuration. You can even do firmware updates over, over the network as well if you need to. The other type of device is a class C device, which is always listening. So these are typically mains powered things. Um, the street lighting controller is the, the typical one we go for here that it's got a power supply all the time and so we can then have the radio on it's in very low power consumption mode but because you're not on battery it doesn't doesn't matter how how much you're using there 
and that device then can be sent data um, and commands immediately so you can turn the light on and off in almost real time so the gateways um, forward the packets on so they receive the small packets from the device and forward that onto a network server and the network server deals with um, deduplicating the data so if your device is received by multiple gateways like they are in Norwich um, only one packet will get forwarded on to, the, to your application and it also deals with which gateway is closest to your device and best place to send any downlink messages to it and as I mentioned previously all of the packets are end-to-end -end encrypted so we know that we've got security there so what can you do with this technology well, there's a whole range of opportunities. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of them. Um, Kurt from Norfolk County Council is going to talk um, after this about um, the innovation network and some of the applications that um, Norfolk County Council have, have come, come up with and, and things that we've worked with them on. So I'll talk about a bit more generally what, what could be possible for um, organisations in, well, across the UK, but particularly in Norfolk and Suffolk, so we can take advantage of um, the innovation network. So from a smart building point of view, we offer meeting room occupancy, and desk occupancy sensors, quite topical at the moment, CO2 level monitoring. Um, we can tell you whether your heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems are operating correctly. We've got demand driven cleaning systems. So we have sensors on um, toilet doors and uh, in communal areas that then uh, inform the cleaning staff where their services are required. So you're not cleaning a, an area that hasn't been used and high touch areas and, and highly used areas get extra. We do utility metering, um, which is great for um, sub metering of uh, like shared office spaces. You can even uh, go for a bit of gamification on this, try and get people to drive down their consumption by having a leaderboard within your, in your office space. We do service on demand. So there's a little picture on the bottom of the slide here of a, um, a call point button. We have these installed in communal areas and office blocks to allow people to, to notify the um, building managers when something needs doing. So in, in our office here, we have them for topping up the tea and coffee, which is uh, very widely used. Sends a text message then to the building manager who uh, comes and uh, tops it up for you. And predictive maintenance. So there's sensors that can be attached to things like lift motors and HVAC systems that will monitor the performance of that machinery and alert you um, if anything unusual occurs. So you can start to see when an unusual vibration um, starts to be detected in motors. That's normally a, a good indication that it's going to fail soon. Uh, allows you to um, arrange service calls and fix that equipment before it becomes a problem. Flood monitoring is a really big area of interest as well. Um, We've got a range of different sensors with different technologies, um, from radar and, and laser sensors to the ultrasonic one that you can see on here. And these can be installed. We've got them installed with the Broads Authority on uh, various bridges in, in Norfolk. Um, and we also do ones that are installed in, in sewers for um, blockage detection and prevention. So they, they can integrate directly with pumping stations and automated control valves that allows you to rather than just report that there is a flooding incident about to happen, you can actually take some action um, autonomously to, to mitigate that risk um, and hold water further up the system um, and allow you a bit of time to, to resolve the issue before it needs clearing. Footfall counting is really popular. So we've got a project with Norfolk Trails Network um, and Broadland District Council at the moment. This picture is on one of their new country parks. Um, so these devices are great for, for monitoring who or how many people are using your facility, great for tourist attractions as well. Um, battery powered again, lasts for several years on, on a um, set of AA batteries. And they monitor the number of people that pass in each direction and report that back over the LoRaWAN network to our software platform. Waste bin monitoring. So we've all seen uh, overflowing bins in busy areas. You also have the, the converse of that is um, councils are spending a lot of time and effort visiting bins in laybys and remote locations, which maybe don't need emptying. And so these sensors will monitor the level of waste in a bin, report when they need emptying. They integrate with some uh, very clever route planning software that will allow you to um, route your 
collections appropriately and it uses uh, some machine learning to identify when bins are likely to fill up so how often how they, their fill rates typically over a period of time um, and it will allow you to proactively plan for collections they also have temperature sensors for fire detection and tilt sensors so if the bins have been knocked over or vandalized you know about it as well um, we've been doing some work with great yarmouth borough council on um, potentially installing these in some of their seafront locations to help um, particularly in the summer season when things fill up really quickly give a better service for um, the public using the areas but also more effective for them that they don't spend all day driving around looking for bins that may or may not be full asset tracking is a really interesting one so the, the norfolk and suffolk innovation network covers a, a large proportion of norfolk and suffolk at the moment so i mean if you've got machinery trailers vehicles even livestock that you want to keep track of these low power um, devices are great value you can connect them um, to the network for free um, and they have a whole range of configuration options you can set um, working hours and speed limits so you can be notified if your um, your equipment is moved outside normal working hours or your vehicles are speeding over <laughs> in particular areas they're really small battery powered i've had one of these on the dashboard of my car um, running for nearly two years now um, without changing the batteries uh, it reports while i'm driving around um, every minute where my location is we use that to to help map the the actual real world coverage of the innovation network as you can see in the screenshot this is where i where i drove around in uh, in horseford the other day on my way to a meeting another really interesting opportunity smart street lighting i mentioned this for the the class c devices earlier um almost all the street lights um deployed in the uk have the same uh, connector on the top of them for a dust till dawn sensor and it's really easy to swap that for a, a LoRaWAN device and make that a smart street light. So um, these devices monitor the energy consumption, they detect faults with the lights, and they allow um, a much more detailed control of the, uh, of the fittings and the schedule for them. So we can create groups of lights, um, assign them a specific schedule, dimming patterns, and then you can override that. So for example, if you had a um, a major event on somewhere you could decide that for that event you want brighter lights on the roads around that area so you can override the profile just for that particular period of time maybe for an hour or two after the event um, and then drop back down to your normal levels again the benefit of the energy monitoring here is you can you can detect when lights are on all day and um, where there's been a fault and they're wasting energy but also street lights are normally billed as a unmetered um, supply. So the, uh, the distribution network operator for the electricity in, in the area will make an assumption about how much that light uses and charge the um, local authority appropriately. Um, whereas that doesn't take into account any energy saving measures they've got with timings um, or dimming profiles. Whereas this system allows us to monitor the exact energy consumption and you can be billed for exactly what you've used and no, um, no additional stuff. So uh, I rattled through that just in time, I think, but Kurt has got some, some more use cases coming up in his slides, which, which we've been working on. Um, so the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network has been um, key to the success of our business. Um, we started um, the company based on um, some use cases that Norfolk County Council presented to uh, to a community group that I was involved with. Um, so road temperature monitoring for, for winter gritting was our, our first project. And that's really um, kicked off the, the whole of our, our business our, um, and led to a whole load of other projects with other local authorities. So um, we'll hand over to Kurt in a moment who will talk about a bit more about this if anybody is interested in uh, learning a bit more about LoRaWAN technology or how it might how it might be useful to your your organization um, do drop me an email I'll put my uh, I'll put the website and uh, my LinkedIn in the chat in a minute and uh, happy to answer any questions thanks so much Michael um, again I think we, we can take questions in the in the uh, in the panel a bit later but no brilliant explainer 
I think uh, it's the best explainer I've had of what a LoRaWAN network actually is. is it, you've explained IoT, what that kind of means. Um, and, you know, again, picking up the convergence between things like sensors, networks, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, many of these other technologies kind of coming together. Um, but um, I'm going to pass over now to Kurt, um, who's very kindly agreed to join us from Norfolk County Council. And Kurt and I have spoken on a couple of conference platforms in the last in the last month. Uh, we were at Talking Tech. It was really great to meet Kurt properly at Talking Tech and hear about what's going on and was very inspired to hear about the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network. So Kurt, over to you. Thank you, Tim. And, and I'm really glad to be here. So um, it's great to hear from Michael because he's one of the really good success stories that have come out of a project that originally and is funded by the local enterprise partnership, the local LEP. So um, that, that's one of the reasons why we have rolled out this large network. Um, but I'm going to show you some of the, rather than talk about the network too much, I'm going to show you some of our use cases, as Michael said um uh, around this technology because some of them really are interesting and they could be game changers but while i'm talking i think for the audience the the one thing for me that jumps out is this is an opportunity it's an opportunity for local businesses to either experiment with this technology to see if they can create a business out of it to use the technology to improve their already commercial offerings or to innovate so that's what, how we see it in terms of uh, public sector using this network, but local businesses can sell to businesses, you know, they can create dashboards and stuff. So let me try and bring it to life for you a bit. But just to recap, it's the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network and the top left there is, is a map of Norfolk and all those purple lines are sensors talking to gateways. So it's here, it's now, we're still rolling out, it's getting bigger and bigger, it should cover all of Norfolk and Suffolk. But as you can see, you can put a sensor in Great Yarmouth or, or Norwich and that'll send that data 25 miles to wherever the gateway is and you can, you can gather that data and do something with it. Um, I just thought I'd quickly show you where some of the gateways are. As you can see, they're all over the region, where these lightning bolts are, are where the gateways are. So if you were to put a sensor in Great Yarmouth, that's got several gateways that could send that data to. So it's got an inbuilt resilience. Um, and Michael's already talked about how it works. Sensors sending data to a gateway, and then that data being accessible either over the internet or on a dashboard. But let's get into the meat of it. So. Um, on the left here, we've got a load of deployed. So these are things that are real and live and working use cases, uh, ranging from winter gritting, where we're monitoring the temperature in the roads, and I'll talk a bit about more of that, all the way down to our latest, most exciting project around adult social care, where we monitor people to help them live independently longer. In the middle, there's other use cases that are under investigation. And what we mean by that, that is we're actively working on them to see if there's a, a business case for delivering them. And on the right, when we've talked to many people about the projects we want to run, these are other ideas. Um, there's many more than this, but these are ones that are bubbled to the top because they have particular uh, uh, things that we, we need to address. I'll give you an example on there, bridge, bridge stress monitoring. Apparently we get a lot of people driving into bridges or on the broads, we get people who try to get their boats under bridges and get the heads stuck between the boat and, and the bridge because they underestimate how to get through, which is a health and safety issue. But generally there's a lot going on. So our real first one was when we started rolling out the network and we worked with Michael um, to put sensors, if you look at the image at the top right, the, the temperature sensors in, in the highway to monitor road temperature. And we, we've been using this for the last two years. So we've put a number of sensors out there. What they do is tell us whether we're getting there freezing and they help inform the decisions around do we send our gritting lorries out. Now, what's interesting about this story is we already did that. We already had a system and the, the, the weather stations that we used, there were six around the county. So for all of Norfolk, there were six and they cost us, um, it cost us 3.4 million pound a year to do the our gritting run. But the, the, um, those sensors cost about 25 to 30 K per sensor. These ones that we've put in the ground, you know, we're talking a couple of hundred pounds. So there was a big saving, but also it gave us more data. 
so instantly that said there was there was an opportunity for both us to improve our services but as i said more importantly for a local business to support us doing something different to innovate and hopefully to build a business on on the back of it or provide services to other businesses in the region so we jump from that first use case to this one this this is what we call project natalie uh, it's Norfolk Assistive Technology Application for Living Independently. Basically, how are we going to take the pressure off the system where we've got a growing older population and um, they use all the different services that we have from the health service to adult social services, and it's a growing challenge. Let me put that into context. We spend £1 million a day on adult social care. That's a big number. The population's um, getting older and we've got people migrating into Norfolk to retire with pe people in housing um, uh, with with care we've got a lot of residents but traditionally the technology we've used to assist people has, has uh, uh, historically been disparate and not worked very well together yeah um, so here's some numbers about that but the reality is you know look 20,000 people received short and long-term care packages in Norfolk every year and we've got a growing growing population getting older and we predict by 2030 there'll be 274,000 people that need help and then, and then we look at the 85 uh, age bracket and 77 percent of them um, over the same period so they're big numbers big money and a big problem um, so our vision for the project is let's support people to live independently longer let's not get them into the system that early you know let's try and keep them out of the system can we take the strain off the support services using this tech? Um, can we enable trusted family and friends to help them? And also, if, we, if we're using data, can we aggregate it and inform our services so we know when to intervene? Um, but my favourite bit is, can we innovate around this, this service? So here's some sensors that we've put into uh, people's homes. We've started with our staff. Um, and then we've now moved on. So this is a live project onto into some real, real service users. So we've got environment sensors, motion, light, temperature. These are the sort of sensors Michael was talking about for some of the other applications. Um, we can tell whether doors are open and closed and medicine cupboards and, and boxes. Um, is the kettle been put on? How, what time is the kettle been put on and temperature? So anything you think you can monitor, we can. So we've put this group, this, these are the specific ones we've put in people's homes. And it's got really interesting. So Ali Cubit won't mind me sharing this. I've talked to him about that. So we put some in his house. He's, he's a guy who works for me. And as you can see, we were starting to monitor and getting this type of data out of it. Then we were uh, looking at the data in a different way. And that was showing us on what dates you can see things pulsing on and off in terms of room occupancy, where, where he would spend most of his time. And this led on our journey to a, a live pilot where we've got all of these sensors in someone's home and it's helping us understand what they do. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Obviously, we have to get their permission to, to monitor, of course we do. But the, the, the example is if someone normally gets up and puts the kettle on by nine o'clock in the morning, and that's their regular pattern, if we apply machine learning to the data, and then they don't one day, we could automatically inform a trusted member of the family or a friend to pop round or give them a call to check they're okay. Now, the earlier we intervene on things when things go wrong, the less likely people are to go into the, the other systems. So that's an exciting project called Natalie, but obviously from us, we're a county council, we're not in the business of providing sensors, we're not in the business of creating all this, this uh, collecting this data and put it on dashboards what we want is the information so we can improve our services and that's where there's a great opportunity for businesses in the region to to get involved in some of the things we want to do to innovate um and and as you can see i've, I've put it on a slide for anybody who wants the slides afterwards so they can see what we're, we, we we think we're doing with this data now let's jump from there to somewhere else so uh, you may have heard of ben burgess a big agri cultural uh, company that provides things like tractors to the farming community they've jumped on the network and this map on the left is showing where they've got sensors in farms in the region in Norfolk um, providing data so there's the sensor providing data to farmers and they're putting it in their hands in, in an iPhone application so they 
can tell when to spray their crops, spray their apples. So, you know, they, they're looking at precipitation, air temperature, um, dew point, etc. So I'm not a farmer. However, I believe I understand this is very useful to them. So Ben Burgess is following us around as we roll out the network and they got this app, app up and running within six weeks. They already had those sensors I showed you, but they didn't have the, the mechanism to get the data from the sensors into the, into the, the app. So they, they've developed this with a company and now farmers are actually using that live. Other things we're doing are monitoring our buildings and our community hubs and providing graphical dashboards like this to show, um, uh, show uh, humidity, damp and things like that. And as you can see, there's more and more data coming out. And what we're trying to do is make this data public where possible, you know, where, where, where we're allowed to. So then people can, can do other things with it. This is County Hall pre-pandemic. That center on the right is something that Michael Price, who spoke earlier, gave me to put under these desks so we can monitor whether they're free or busy. So this was a mock-up trial of desk monitoring. And funny that now the pandemic's over, we're now thinking, well, we need to monitor desks so we, people can book them when they come back into the office. Um, and another thing we did um, during the pandemic, we had to stand up a temporary mortuary unfortunately, at RAF Coltishula, which is now called Scotto. And uh, we didn't have the connectivity there to monitor the temperature in that mortuary. So we used this technology to get that implemented within five to six weeks. It's a really good success story there. Um, other things we're doing, there's uh, only a few more that I was going to share today. So there's um, the police has asked us to look at electric fences because when they fail, um, livestock gets on the road and we've had fatalities in Norfolk when this happened. So we want to be able to provide some uh, some farmers some sensors they can plug into their, their electric fences and when they're off, broken, cut, they, they're made aware of them. So that's one thing we're looking at, but the, the, this is a growing area. Agritech and using this technology um, uh, is, is very underused and, and we're now looking at working with some of the county farms to put this technology in place. We've got, had three farmers, new farmers, have approached us to say, can we put stuff on their farms? Including when we plant trees, uh, to monitor them, to make sure that they're growing correctly, because we've committed to plant a million trees over the next five seasons. But my most favourite one is this one. This is uh, Gresson Hall Rural Life Museum and on the left is a map where I've walked around with a sensor and then we've given it to staff to monitor where people go, are they finding all the exhibits and are they actually staying there for any period of time. This informs the service so they can improve what they do there. So that's it, that's all the use cases. Um, some of these, we're happy if, if people want to contact us and say we'd like to have a, a crack at doing that one or getting involved with that one. Or if you just want to find out more about the technology, you can either look at these slides. So I've put some links on here. Uh, that's Alex Cliff from Highways, do the Highways bit. But if you click on these, they'll take you to videos to tell you what we're doing, how to get involved. But if not, please come and speak to me to find out more. There's my email, there's my LinkedIn and there's my Twitter. Thank you. Thank you.